everyone. Um, just a quick word of thanks to Susanna and Kiki. Um, I don't see her, but thank you. She's not there. Oh, very good. There she is. Um, thank you for putting together, setting the stage for what is turning out to be a really fabulous um, set of papers and conversations that we will be starting with. So. Um, and I am actually um, sort of um, following uh, the request not to present an academic paper in the manner of all conferences and following my uh, co-panelists in that. And so what I have in mind is to sort of give you an overview of some of the work that I've been doing. This is related to the efforts to decriminalize homosexuality in the Indian context and to do it in a way that I think will sort of both help flesh out the story of it, the, the empirical piece of it, but also the analytical, but allow for sort of connections between papers that have come before and you know, are on this panel. Um, so in 2001, NAS Foundation, uh, which is an HIV AIDS related organization based in New Delhi, filed a writ petition with the Delhi High Court um, asking that the um, Section 377, which is our anti-sodomy law, um, be decriminalized. And what they have specifically asked for is that this law, which is a relic of uh, colonial rule, it was introduced in 1860, they specifically asked for this law to be modified um, so that same-sex consensual uh, sexual activity among adults conducted in private no longer fall under the purview of the anti-sodomy law. And um, th this law, which had been introduced in 1860, had basically remained on the books um, even after India became independent. But as many anti-sodomy laws around the world, especially the ones used, uh, you know, introduced by the British, it was relatively little used. Um, but important symbolically, um, and I think this sort of goes to the point earlier that Peter was making about sort of how law is something that has tremendous influence in our lives and you can't not engage it, right? You can't completely sidestep it. Um, initially, the NAS Foundation writ was actually not very well known, nor was it based on a lot of consultation um, that the organization had with other groups. And uh, lots of people, in fact, initially did not, weren't even aware that such a uh, um, challenge had been filed in Delhi High Court. The tide, however, turned significantly in 2003 um, when the government, um, speaking on behalf of the state, so to speak, and a number of um, state units that were named as respondents in the petition, the government filed its response in Delhi High Court. And in a lot of ways, the, it was homophobic, it was you know, sort of taking a very clear position against the Nasrit and you know, wanting to uh, continue upholding the um, Section 377. So in a lot of ways it was predictable, but it was also nuanced. Um, and it was, in some ways, as I'm going to sort of make the point, it was inconsistent in its reasoning. So in part, the government was arguing that yes, um, you know, this law needs to be upheld and, um, you know, it's important and Indian society is not ready for the change. And at the same time, there was conciliatory logic saying that in any case, the law is not really used and courts use, you know, contemporary definitions in when applying this particular law. So there was, a, you know, this sort of, um, this kind of reasoning. But nonetheless, what it did is it really unified a lot of the sexuality rights constituencies around the country in favor of the NAS petition. So where earlier there had been sort of some misgivings, the fact that NAS was you know, uh, acting independently, and also there had been criticism about that NAS was actually leading this kind of turn to law, and that law was going to be the mechanism um, in terms of uh, striving for social justice for sexual and gender minorities. So there had been criticism along these lines, but much of that criticism then abated, and you get this kind of coalescing of, um, of mobilization around Section 377. So it really does become the flashpoint in terms of this emerging struggle for social justice. Yeah. Um, I heard about this in uh, 2002. It came to my attention that NAS had actually filed such a petition and I have been, I started to follow it with field work um, since then. 
And increasingly, my interest turned to state units and state agencies, um, in some ways because of the way in which the NAS petition was formulated. So it named a number of state respondents, Delhi Police, um, the Ministry of Home Affairs, so the Union Government of India, um, the National AIDS Council, which is an AIDS control organization, sorry. Um, so these are all sort of state units that were named as respondents in the NAS petition initially. And so that inspired a kind of an interest in terms of how state agencies and units are actually responding to this. How do they make sense of it? but also in terms of shared procedures, shared mechanisms of state, right? So if the government is responding in courts, then who actually drafts that response? How does it actually get done? The sort of the shared mechanisms of governance. And it also um, uh, expanded to really thinking about sort of the mechanisms of governance around Section 377, the anti-sodomy law. So how, what does the case law look like? What does the archive look like? Um, how do police make sense of it? Um, in India, we have something, the police reports are called first information reports. So what do the first information reports look like? If this law is in fact little used, but at the same time, an impediment in lots of ways, you know, particularly around police harassment, police abuse, so then what does the governance of this look like in a very quotidian kind of way? And um, as I was doing this, one of the things that sort of occurred, that uh, you know, really was striking in a way that was similar to the government's response is the inconsistencies around the use of the law. So one inconsistency had to do with the fact that even though this is the anti-sodomy law, more than 95% of the case law, which is not very much, it's about, you know, less than 200 cases in the last 150 years, had to do with child sexual assault. Now, in part, this is a lacuna in um, the legal system until recently in the Indian context in that our laws are narrowly conceptualized as rape laws, right? So vag coerced vaginal penal penetration. Um, and so when you have aggravated sexual assault, um, you know, uh, e even for adult women, but particularly in terms of children and male children, there is no other law in which that assault could be prosecuted until as recently as 2013. Yeah. So this was actually filling in a gap. So on the one hand, while this is supposed to be about, um, you know, sort of prohibition, um, uh, prohibiting uh, same-sex sexual activity among adults, at the same time it was really being used in terms of uh, to prosecute child sexual assault and in some cases also assault against women, uh, particularly when it sort of exceeded um, the scope of rape. Um, the other thing was sort of, another sort of point of inconsistency to give you an example, um, emerged around policing. So when I had uh, discussion groups with members of Delhi Police, um, and I had sort of been, you know, doing a rounds of police stations and a number of informal conversations, what was really striking and in many ways unexpected, but I suppose it shouldn't have been, was the fact that the Delhi police associated um, Section 377 with crime committed by religious cultural minorities, and particularly Muslims. To some degree, six as well, six are, uh, that's another religious group um, constituting no more than about 3% of the population, um, but that there was this sort of very consistent association with um, the anti-sodomy law, the crime committed under it, and uh, particularly Muslims and um, to some degree six. So it, which for me then meant that I had to really reflect on a whole sort of politics of racialization that is occurring and has been occurring for, um, you know, sort of for a while within the Indian context, even though the dominant story is we're all the same, we all, you know, phenotypically we're the same, um, but yet there is a way in which um, uh, the, um, the discussion around the anti-sodomy law really sort of forces one to think about the ways in which, um, um, you know, sort of a politics of racialization actually proceed on a day-to-day -day level, you know, even when we don't look phenotypically different. And I can talk more about that if people are interested. Um, but the sort of, the, the point that emerged for me is that if you look at this sort of inconsistency around law, um, particularly in terms of the state, a lot of very interesting and I think um, helpful post-structuralist literature on the state will really make that point. 
that the state itself is in fact a myth, right? And um, that states are um, uh, inconsistent and biased, and I think that's an important insight, but it's not enough. And to me, what started to emerge was the importance of actually reading sexuality into this kind of attention to subjectivity, right? So that if subjectivity is not simply about bias and prejudice and inconsistency, it certainly is all that. But if we start to really build and think about it from the angle of sexuality, in terms of passion, in terms of affect, then I think a somewhat different terrain starts to open up. And for me, um, the sort of the gathering insight out of that was really about the ways in which states are preoccupied with governing sexuality. Yes, and it's not so much. And the point is not so much about uh, governing sexuality for political profit or some kind of you know sort of financial gain. Because I think our dominant you know analysis, our analytics really sort of make that point that this is about some kind of immediate you know, political expediency. But I think there's something far deeper um, you know, in terms of governing sexuality, and that is about the ways in which it helps constitute state effect. So if we take that post-structuralist insight, um, and here I'm really using the work of Timothy Mitchell, um, who talks about states as a kind of, as a discursive effect, that states are not essential a priori realities, but in fact a discursive effects that have to be continually produced. And part of the effect is the imagination of the state as somehow distinct, indispensable, a freestanding entity that has, you know, sort of uh, enduring since times immemorial. But that, that very effect um, is produced or sort of perpetuated through governing sexuality. Yeah? And that this idea, this kind of recourse to sexuality in order to sort of stabilize the myth of states and their indispensability becomes increasingly important as we get this sort of this view that states are eroding under neoliberal effect, right? So, I mean, I, and I think that's something that we can push back and really question because what is clear in terms of as a result of neoliberal imperatives is that states are reconfiguring rather than simply retrenching, right? So just as they're retrenching in some respects, they're also expanding in others. And this, this idea that sexuality, you know, sort of poses this, um, this threat, this danger to society is significant in really helping stabilize this idea of the state. And here I would say it's sort of we need to think about sexuality not in that kind of narrow sense, um, of desire or sexual activity or sexual relations, but in that kind of broader sense as it relates to population, as it relates to demographics, the sort of the continuation, uh, you know, birth rates, reproductive rates, uh, disease, death, labor, in that much broader, in that sort of broader construct is somehow sexuality is foundational to society, right? So in, when we start to see it that way, um, the stakes of governing sexuality, of sort of um, managing sexuality, and particularly the state's role in this becomes more important. So in a sense, what I'm asking us to think about is to sort of move um, beyond that idea that states regulate sexuality. They certainly do, and they impact sexual desire or sexual relationships or work in, in lots of ways. And we have plenty of evidence. And the idea or the approach that I'm sort of um, really pushing toward is the ways in which sexuality impacts the state, right? Sort of what is that relationship and why does this kind of preoccupation with governing sexuality become so important? And um, in the sort of the shorthand of this is this is what I'm calling the sexual state. Um, and the idea is to sort of offer a critique of it. So seen from this lens, um, the NAS Foundation struggle um, in, inadvertently, in my uh, reading, triggers this um, analytic of the sexual state, right? It sort of, it turns to the state in order to, um, in order to um, uh, petition for rights, but it, in a sense, it sort of foregrounds all of this. It, it brings it out, or it sort of surfaces all of this. And that's 
been the way in which I've understood or been approaching the anti-sodomy law in, in terms of sort of how does it work um, as well as the legal struggle that has followed um, since uh, the Nass Foundation grant. So as I was following, uh, as the struggle sort of unfolded, um, one of the turning points came in 2009 when the Delhi High Court, and it was a historic decision, decriminalized homosexuality. So at the time, they ruled after about eight years, they ruled in favor of the Nas Rid um, to decriminalize homosexuality. And the text of the decision is really quite interesting. It's um, very well thought out. It's, um, parts of it are very beautifully written. And um, it had a lot of, you know, it's, um, um, I think what was really distinctive and important about it is that for the first time, it was extending constitutional rights to same-sex um, sexuality, sexual, uh, sexual minorities and gender minorities. And in that sense, it sort of used um, the arguments around privacy that Peter was alluding to also uh, as well earlier. Um, you know, that uh, it's the right to privacy, it's the right to, um, right to life with dignity and autonomy, and um, e equality. So some of the basic fundamental rights um, were being used in order, to, um, in, in order to rule in favor of the NAS decision. And um, I think what was also important about this decision is that for the first time, um, it was explicitly recognizing sexual orientation, right? So in a sense, it is about um, sexual and gender minorities, but it was opening up the terrain for everybody in terms of the recognition of sexual orientation as um, something that is to be protected by the Constitution. Um, so in four years later, when the Supreme Court decision, and this was as recent as 2013, December 2013, when the Supreme Court ruled to turn down the Delhi High Court and in fact uphold the anti-sodomy law, you can imagine what a shock it was. It was unexpected, it was um, troubling, it was dismaying, um, you know, in, in all of those respects. And it, the, it, the problem was not just in terms of the outcome, it was also in terms of the text. Um, oh, okay, I uh, should be fine. Um, and it was, what was important about this is that um, the decision came out in uh, response to a ragtag group of appellants. These were appellants, these were individuals, groups, organizations that had not been part of the legal process so far. And this is a kind of oddity of the Indian um, uh, uh, court system that the justices in fact allowed um, this group of people that had not been part of the process so far to, to, to become part of it. And ironically, it put Nas in the position of now being the defendant. Right, so that was um, um, the text of the ruling had a number of errors. It was a sloppy. It, it was just sloppily done, and you know there was there's no two ways about it. Um, and I mean not just in terms of the arguments, but it's how it's presented and errors and so on and so forth. Um, but the the crux of it was that um, the Delhi High Court was wrong in its ruling because they should have ex exercised judicial restraint. And um, they turned over, the Supreme Court justices turned over the matter to the legislature. And this is where I'm sort of getting at this argument. So on the one hand, if the Delhi High Court tried at some level to mitigate state reach over same-sex sexualities, right? But, and it wasn't terribly successful um, because, you know, on the one hand, courts are doing that, right? So courts are sort of reaffirming their own role to say, you know, another arm of the state needs to sort of reduce its reach. But still, it was in good faith, it was an effort to do that. Um, the Supreme Court decision very clearly was about not only continuing the criminalization of homosexuality, but also expanding the reach of the legislature. And when you see this in conjunction with the recently passed sexual assault laws that were done in 2012, and then more recently, there is a sort of pre prevention and protection, uh, prevention of child sexual offenses act that was passed. What you get is precisely that kind of proliferation of legislation, right, rather than the attenuation of the state. And the anxiety is that if we don't do this, it is going to um, um, uh, herald doom. If I have one last thing, and I think the sort of the point that I want to end this um, 
uh, uh, end this with is that this is, you know, in some ways it's easy to say, easy to see a context such as India as a kind of the Supreme Court as sort of reflecting a throwback on the past. And if, but if you read the, the text of the ruling, it is not. They are constantly talking about changes that take place in society. Um, they are constantly talking about things that are not the same, right? And so the way I'm reading this, and the way I'm, I, I, I think it's sort of one can fruitfully understand it, is that this is about the context of post-liberalization in, in India, which is about protecting, which is about um, which is about a certain kind of Indianness, which is n not as a throwback to the past, but one that is about going forward. And I think that is an important thing that we should consider, particularly in terms of how to understand this and how to think strategically about going forward. Thank you.